Continuing our journey in chemical kinetics, we're going to talk about collision theory. And so here you can see the learning outcomes expectations. Feel free to pause and read through these before we dive into everything. In our journey so far in chemical kinetics, we started talking about reaction rates and factors that can influence those rates. We did rate laws, which gives us a nice relationship with a rate constant. We did integrated rate laws, which gives us concentration time relationships. And so we spent a lot of time talking about how fast reactions happen. And we've alluded to um, things like uh, rate laws being different depending on the mechanism of reaction. So for the remainder of the chapter, we're gonna really dive into what this means, what, what it means to be a mechanism of reaction or how a reaction happens. And so we'll start that journey with 12.5, which is collision theory. And so collision theory basically says you need three things for a reaction to occur. You need molecules must collide, they must have enough energy to make and break bonds, and they must have the correct orientation to react. And so we're going to dive through each one of these individually, um, starting with molecules must collide. And so this one, I mean, this should seem intuitive, right? For, for some transformation to occur, molecules must collide with each other. But there are, there are really strong implications for this molecules must collide. Because really it, it, it tells you the rate of the reaction is dependent on how often they collide. And so here's a proportionality here. Number of collisions per unit time, that's going to give you the rate of reaction, assuming it's a single step process. And so if we're going to combine oxygen with O3, red spheres and blue spheres need to bounce into each other to eventually make this uh, O2 or two O2 molecules. And so because uh, molecules must collide, it's going to depend on the temperature of the reaction. And so this is a graph that we saw earlier, kinetic energy versus number of molecules. This is essentially a histogram that says at low temperature molecules are moving slower than they are at higher temperature. And so we could think about this in terms of molecular motion, right? At lower temperatures, molecules are moving slower in general. And so if red and blue spheres need to collide, at lower temperatures, these molecules molecules are going to collide less. In contrast, if we increase the temperature, on average, these molecules and spheres are going to be moving faster. Their collisions are going to be a lot more prevalent. And so um, this rate number collision to relationships, th the fact that molecules must collide automatically tells us there's going to be a temperature dependence. The higher the temperature, the faster they're moving, the more likely these collisions are to occur. And so at lower temperatures, the number of collisions go down, the rate goes down. At higher temperatures, the number of collisions that goes up and the rate of the reaction goes up. And so we have another parameter that dictates the number of collisions and that's concentration. And so let's describe O in a green sphere, O3 in a yellow sphere. Those guys have to collide and it's going to depend on how many of these spheres exist, not just how fast they're going, but how many there are. And so let's say we have a rate law for this reaction. Rate is equal to K concentration of A to the 1, B to the 1. We'll say it's a second order reaction, first order in A, first order in B. And so for a single step, the rate law is going to be dictated by the concentrations directly. And so if we double the amount of A, we'll expect the rate to double. And so we can look at this graphically and say, okay, we have A's and B's and they need to collide. If we have two A's and two B's, there's your number of collisions. You can have four interactions. Let's say we increase the number of A's. Then we have six interactions. If we can increase the A's more, we have eight interactions. And so for a first order reaction, we know from our previous rate law that if we double the amount of A, the rate should double. And that's exactly what we see. We double the amount of A here, A here. The number of interactions doubles because that number of collisions doubles. The rate of the reaction was doubles. And so there's effectively a direct proportionality between rate and concentration. The exception here is a zero order rate law where concentration doesn't matter, but for, for a first order, second order, so on and so forth, concentration matters. For a first order, it's proportional. Doubling A doubles the number of collisions, doubles the rate of the reaction. And so molecules must collide. We know that has a temperature dependence. We know that has a concentration dependence. And we'll dive into that temperature dependence later with the Arrhenius equation. But as the temperature goes up, collisions go up, reaction rate goes up. For concentration, as the concentration goes up, collisions go up, rate of the reaction goes up. But collisions are not enough. Things can collide all day and no reaction can still occur because it depends on how they're colliding. And so there's two additional parameters we're going to talk about. Um, the next one is going to be if they have enough energy to make and break bonds. And so collisions is step one, but how fast they can collide dictates whether the reaction occurs.
And so when you think about what happens during this O plus O3 reaction, effectively what we need to do is these two to smash into each other and we need to break a bond between an oxygen and oxygen on O3 and we need to make a bond on oxygen combining with one of those O atoms from O3. And so this takes energy, this releases energy, that energy is what dictates whether the reaction will happen or not. And so again, it's not enough to collide. You need to translate this kinetic energy into bond breaking in bond making energy and so essentially if you have kinetic energy that's where all this comes from right how how fast do they smash into each other if your kinetic energy is too slow or they're moving too slowly and there's not enough kinetic energy it will not break that bond it's just not pumping enough energy in the system to dissociate one of these oo bonds in o3 and so these guys will just bounce off each other and nothing will happen but if that kinetic energy of that collision is greater than the bond energy, these are smashing together so hard that they're dumping enough energy into this system that it's going to dissociate this bond. It basically breaks, it vibrates the molecule apart. So one oxygen dissociates and combines with that one, and all of a sudden you get O2. And so this is why it's not enough to collide. In this case, they collide and bounce off each other. In this case, they collide, they have enough kinetic energy, they break a bond, and they uh, make their reaction proceed. And so this energy making this happen, this, this how much kinetic energy we need to put in the system to make this occur, is related to a term called activation energy. And there's a formal definition, the minimum energy that must be overcome for a reaction to occur. And so casually we know what activation energy is, right? There's an activation energy to you getting off the couch while watching TV to go get food, right? We use that kind of nomenclature fairly casually, but in the sciences it has a formal definition. And so if you're going to roll this rock down a hill, well, you got to get it up over the edge first. And so that's the activation energy for the process to occur. And so chemical kinetics, we have something very similar. We we use a diagram that looks like this. It's called a reaction coordinate diagram. It basically says if A is going to go to B, it just doesn't go there. It can't go there. It has to have enough energy to get over that hill. It has to have enough energy to break those bonds or make the transformation occur. And that is what we describe as activation energy. And so this is the classical physics analogy. This is the chemical analogy, but it, this is the chemical descriptor. But it turns out they're very closely related. And so there's your reaction coordinate diagram. And this is a very information dense, to tell, dense uh, depiction to tell you something about, you know, a lot of different things happening in this process. And so here we have energy on the y-axis and we have reaction coordinate, or sometimes it's described as reaction progression. It's kind of a nebulous descriptor. It depends on what you're discussing. Uh, but for us, we'll call it reaction coordinate or reaction progression. And so on the left side, you typically have reactants. On the right side, you typically have products and you have an overall energy change with reaction. This can be depicted in enthalpy, Gibbs free energy, or um, overall energy. Uh, it depends on what you're describing. But the point is, here's where you start. Here's where you end, and there's a hill you have to get over, and that is your activation energy. And so things to note about this, if you go down on this graph, energy is released. If you go up on this graph, energy uh, needs to be added to the system. So for you to go from this point here up to the top of the hill, you have to add energy. But once you get over the end, you're releasing energy. And so your all overall energy release is this delta E, um, and that has to do with the difference in energy between the reactants and the products. And so we'll get into thermodynamics in chapter 16, but the general idea is this has an energy, this has an energy, there's an energy difference between the two, that's the thermodynamic driving force for the reaction. And so this delta E is independent of this activation barrier, it's only the difference for reactants and products, but that information is embedded in this graph. And so the one we really care about in terms of chemical kinetics is this EA here, this activation energy, this energy, this hill that we have to get over for a reaction to occur. And so here's a couple different versions of these uh, reaction coordinate diagrams. Um, so this one is actually an exothermic reaction. If uh, this is uh, delta H on the, the Y axis, reactants are higher energy than products. You're releasing this delta E energy as the reaction progresses. An endothermic reaction looks something like this. It essentially says if you want to go from A to B to C to D, essentially you have to put in more energy than you get back from it. And this reaction happens, it's just it's not as favorable as say an exothermic, at least not thermodynamic, at least not in terms of the enthalpy of the reaction. And so yeah, A to B going to C to D, it's energetically uphill for these to turn into this. That's endothermic, you got to pump more energy Energy and then you get back. Alternatively, exothermic, you get more energy out of the system than you pump into the system. 
And so it depends on the energy relationship between reactants and products. And so we, we, we know we have to collide. We know we have to collide with enough energy to overcome that activation barrier. Um, the question is, how much energy do we need? And so it turns out that's going to be dictated by the temperature of the reaction. Or the, 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 the energy you need is the same, but the amount of molecules that can have that energy is going to be dictated by the temperature. And so we're going to go back to this graph again. We have kinetic energy versus number of molecules. That's our histogram. At a given temperature, most of the molecules are slow, but some of those molecules are going fast. Fast. And so if we relate this histogram, this, this average kinetic energy or kinetic energy, the molecules to this reaction coordinate diagram, we know that some molecules are going really fast and they're going to be going fast enough that they'll smash into each other and they'll go from O plus O3 to giving you O2. They, they have enough kinetic energy, they're going to get over that hill and go to the product side. But there's a lot of molecules that won't, right? There's a lot of molecules that are slow. They might get up the hill a little bit, but then they're going to fall back down. Those are essentially the ones that bounce into each other and then bounce off and stay as O and O3. Only the ones that get over the hill actually transform into the products because it has to get over this activation barrier. And so what this tells us automatically is that this getting over this hill is temperature dependent. Right, because temperature changes the shape of this curve. It changes how many molecules are over this threshold, this activation energy, where it can get over this hill. And so temperature is proportional to kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is proportional to reaction rate. Therefore, our reaction rate um, uh, and is temperature dependent. And so we know reaction rate is temperature dependent. We can measure this experimentally. We can measure rate of reaction versus temperature. And so this is basically you set up a reaction, run it at a given temperature, graph the result, you get a point here, set up another reaction, increase the temperature, measure the rate, get a point here, so on and so forth. And you get a graph that looks something like this. And intuitively, this should make sense. For most reactions, uh, as you increase the temperature, the rate will increase. I think that's uh, universally true. What's nice about this is there's a very very specific relationship between temperature and rate, at least temperature and rate constant. And so if we graph our uh, natural log of rate constant versus one over temperature, we get a graph that looks something like this. And so um, that graph, again, y equals mx plus b, natural log of k is equal to negative ea over r, one over t natural log of a. You don't have to dive into this or where this math comes from, but the important outcome of this is there's a, there's a very particular relationship between rate constant of the reaction your activation energy, and your temperature. And it's known as the Arrhenius equation. And so this Arrhenius equation is very, very important because it essentially says, you know, your rate law is going to be dictated by the temperature, right? Your concentration doesn't change uh, with temperature. Your number of collisions will, but this Arrhenius equation tells you your rate constant is temperature dependence, and it's dictated by A, a pre-exponential factor. For the sake of this class, we're going to just treat this as a nebulous number. It does have physical meaning, but it doesn't matter for the sake of general chemistry too. And then we have e to the negative ea, which is the activation energy. That's the hill you have to get over. Over rt, r is a constant that always stays the same. t is the temperature. And so ignoring the other variables, k is dependent on the activation barrier and the temperature of the system. And so this is why if temperature goes up, the, the rate constant goes up, the reaction rate goes up. If activation barrier goes, um, if this activation energy goes down, as in the hill goes down, your rate constant gets higher and your reaction rate gets faster. And so again, I don't expect you to derive where this came from. I mean, it's nice that straight lines exist, uh, but this equation tells you the relationship, right? If this goes up, this goes down. If this goes up, uh, this goes up. And it depends on this negative sign as well as whether it's in the numerator or denominator of this equation. So yeah, that's the Arrhenius equation. And so it gives us this relationship between rate constant, activation energy, and uh, rate of the reaction. And so we can see two different reactions here. Even if they're making the same reactants and products, these are going to have two different rates. And it's going to be dictated by these hills, the, this activation barrier. And so we have reaction X, which is this one. Let's say it has a pre-exponential of 1,000 and activation energy of 10 kilojoules per mole. And R is a constant. We can calculate a rate constant for this reaction. Likewise, we can do the same thing for Y. The major, the only difference between these two is the activation energy. And so uh, we've changed that number and we can see this reaction is much uh, slower. These numbers are actually flipped. <laughs> and so this should be... Um, 
the activation area, this should be reaction Y, and this one should be reaction X, which has a higher hill. And so the activation air energy is higher for reaction X than it is for Y. I apologize, just change this X and this Y, and this should make sense. But it basically says, if this is X here, the reaction should be slower because the hill is higher, and that's exactly what you get. The rate constant is much smaller. In this case, reaction um, Y, you can see the hill is shorter, uh, the rate constant is larger. And so you can change the temperature of this reaction and do the math for a new temperature, and you can calculate that the rate constant increases, the rate constant increases, which means the rate of the reaction will increase. And so you can see there's a 1.5 fold in this case, a 2.75 fold in this case. And so what this basically tells you is the higher the hill the more temperature matters note that this should be reaction X and this guy should be Y over here and so again the higher the hill the more the temperature matters and so again this reaction you heat up both of these reaction X is going to increase more than reaction Y will all right, so to recap, we know molecules must collide. Temperature dictates the number of collisions as well as rate. Concentration matters because the number of molecules increasing the number of collisions increases the rates. We know we have to have enough energy to make and break bonds, and that's dictated by the Arrhenius equation. Basically, it has to collide with enough kinetic energy to overcome that vibrational or bonding energy, and that's dictated by this activation energy, this hill. And this hill has two, two parameters, right? You have a relationship between Ea and temperature. As temperature goes up more things can go over the hill as temperature goes down less things can go over the hill and that's going to dictate your rate constant and so as temperature goes up rate constant goes up rate goes up or you can figure out ways to shrink the hill we're going to talk about catalysts later rate constant goes up rate of the reaction goes up and so those are two of the three things we need for collision theory, right? Molecules must collide. They must have enough energy to make and break bonds. But collisions and energy still aren't enough. Those aren't the, the entirety of the story. The last one is they need to have the correct orientation to react. And so let's take an example like CO and NO2 giving you CO2 plus NO. And we know we're going to form a CO bond, right? We're going to break an NO bond here. We're going to form a new CO bond over here. And that basically tells us that we need for a C and an O to interact. And so molecules just randomly colliding is not enough. We need an oxygen and a carbon to interact. And so if we take these two, smash them together and do so with enough energy, it doesn't mean a reaction will happen because in this case, we're gonna collide with C with an N and nothing's gonna happen. But if we can collide a C with an O, then we'll get an effective transfer of that oxygen atom. And so it's really easy to get lost in this idea of, you know, rates and rates of reaction or rate laws, but ultimately this is molecules interacting. And like we talked about in chapter 10, molecules have a shape. They have a, uh, a particular structure associated with them and that dictates whether reactions will happen. And that's why this orientation matters with collision theory. And so, the fact that these molecules need the right collision or the right orientation to react basically tells you a lot of the times when they collide, nothing will happen, even if they have enough energy. But once in a while, you will have an effective collision. And so one of the things that goes into this pre-exponential factor is called an orientation factor or a collision frequency factor. Uh, basically says how often do they collide and how many of those collisions are effective. You don't have to know the details of this, but no general picture. You have to collide, you have to have energy. And then the third one is you have to have the right right orientation. And so when you talk about organic chemistry, this is going to matter a lot. And you're not going to talk about it in terms of the Arrhenius equation necessarily, but you'll talk about it in terms of how molecules line up and that dictates whether the reaction occurs or not. All right, so that's it. We have the collision theory. Molecules must collide. There must be enough energy and they must have the correct orientation. If those things happen, the reaction will proceed. The rate of the reaction is dictated by the rate constant and the concentration, which is what happens in our rate law. Rate law is equal to rate constant times concentration. And the uh, rate constant is dictated by that activation energy, that hill you have to get over. And then the concentration dictates the number of collisions that are happening. And so, and also you have a temperature component to all that, which dictates the concentration as well as the number of collisions. All right, so that gets us into collision theory. What must happen for a reaction to proceed? Next, we'll dive into reaction mechanisms, which is what actually does happen as the reaction proceeds.